It is good to see you all with a new year, a new time, a new look. Uh, Y'all look happy. You're smiling. You've only had, what, four days so far of this year? Not too much went wrong. Uh, you stayed in. Uh, it's been, the weather's been nice, a little chilly, but it could be somewhere else where you were snowed in. So quit complaining, this is Ohio. I mean, you've been here long enough to get used to it. Last night we talked about, we, uh, we did our yearly thing where we talked about the vision and some of the things that uh, we believe that God's leading us to. Let me give you just a couple of things real quick as to what's going on and what's happening in the next couple of weeks real quick. Uh, number one is uh, we actually are going to be giving a class. Uh, I'll probably schedule it here within the next week or two. Uh, be given to anyone, and it'll actually be on Sunday morning during the Sunday school hour. And then uh, during that period of time, I'll move out of my class and somebody else will move in and teach it real quick for me for that, those few weeks. And that is this. If you're here and uh, you've been looking for a church and you're really not sure, you know, I, I like this church. I like the guy that preaches. He looks cool. <laughs> Even as old as he is, you know, uh, but uh, but anyway, in all seriousness, it is uh you're looking for the church and, and you would like to know more about the church, how we operate, what we do, things that we offer, uh, and you're looking to do that. Uh, what we'll be doing is on Sunday morning during Sunday school hour starting at 9.30 to 10.15, um, uh, we'll be talking about uh, a new member class, okay? Uh, and so um, that will help you to understand more about who we are, what we do, uh, other than knowing that we're just Calvary Baptist and, and things like that. Uh, that will be happening. We also are, are um, one of the things that we're doing is uh, I've been putting in your bulletins. I didn't do it this week, but I've, it, they will be back next week. It's the things that are called engagers, but I'll also be giving some training on how to use those engagers. Uh, there's some, uh, for those of you that have smartphones uh, that we can put apps on, they're really cool, really neat, to where you can actually track uh, who you've talked to and things like that. Uh, that will be doing a couple other things. We're also developing a disciple, uh, a disciple pipeline. Uh, we'll be working with probably about four people in the very beginning, maybe four to eight, I'm not sure. Depends on how well uh, we can do it. Uh, it's basically online that you can do with me. Uh, there will be homework every week and then we'll get together and we'll kind of discuss that homework. Uh, and, and then after that, after walking through that, uh, your object is now you know what it's all about and now you will pick four people and you will walk four people through that uh, discipline uh, I actually have the book that um, doesn't cost you anything it's all free uh, and so it's just going to cost you some time uh, because the Bible says to make disciples and that's what he, that's what he wants us to do okay so uh, it's really cool uh, you don't have to do a lot of talking it's just a lot of, just some sharing There'll be a whole lot of other things that are happening and a lot of things that are going on. Uh, God's just moving, blessing. One of the other things is uh, we were talking last night, um, and uh, Brother Jonathan, who, uh, can I use your last name of Jones? Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> 
the other the other last name was really uh, I would butcher that one up but but Jones uh, him him and his wife Claire and uh, his son um, he actually is originally from uh, Af from Nigeria Nigeria in, in Africa was actually a church planner pastor over there has come to the states at the right now he is uh, actually a um, hospice pastor uh, in Hamilton out of Hamilton so has a lot of knowledge and things but his heart um, and, and we, we have a passion and we'll, we'll talk kind of about this this morning a, a passion for evangelism uh, and, and so he is right now working uh, with the IMB uh, hopefully getting uh, credentials and everything to actually go back to um, someplace in Africa uh, which would be cool because it, it kind of speaks the language uh, knows you know the, the location knows uh, everything and, and it makes it a little bit easier but uh, looking to plant churches there and uh, reach people for God how long uh, that process sometimes can take a while sometimes can go by real quick but uh, we talked and, and uh, I think you'll find that uh, you'll be seeing a lot of him and, and everything and the other thing that I'm going to uh, make him do is I'm going to make him give the ushers a lesson on how to walk down the aisle <laughs> to receive the offering I'm not trying to embarrass him, but the Bible says that we should we should be happy and rejoicing. And I love I love that dance. It was cool. <laughs> he was happy. Happy to come and get your money. <laughs> the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> But anyway, so there'll be a whole lot of new stuff that, that will be happening. But one of the things that I, I shared with the church um, last night, you know, a lot of times when people think we're not a big church, we're not a mega church, we don't have 200 and some people. But let me say this to y'all, and, and I shared it last night. In a lot of the churches that have 200 to 500 people, a lot of times those churches you will find get the two to five hundred because what happens is they get people transferring membership you know from here to there and everything and, and uh, they'll go and, and church will build and church will drop church will build and church will drop and it goes down like that that's not church growth okay that's church redirection Church growth is actually when you begin to see people saved. And, and to really be a, a growing, prosperous church, they really want your ratio to baptisms to the number of members that you have uh, coming on Sunday morning that they count to basically be somewhere 10 to 1. 10 to 1, you're doing really well. If you come back and look at the numbers uh, in, in our church, it is somewhere close to about 5 to 1. So for every five attenders, we are reaching one person for the Lord. That is a growing church. That puts you actually in the top 5% of uh, Southern Baptist churches, and actually a lot of churches in America. And that's something to be proud of. Because that means you're, you're talking to people, you're reaching people. The Spirit of God is moving. And that's what you look for. You look for that and you look for growth. Okay, and, and so that's that's where we're at. So this morning we're going to start out by a new year, and starting out by the basically the whole center of what we're here for, because a lot of times in churches people are looking to say, okay, uh, where can I serve? What can I do? All of these things that you're that you're trying to do, and, and, and great and wonderful. But there needs to be something else before we get to that point of really being able to serve. And you'll kind of understand as we put the, uh, the scripture back up on the uh, screen, if you would. And uh, you can read along with me in uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Talking about the two sisters of, of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It says, while they were traveling... He entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. 
She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So I tell her, so, so tell her to give me a hand. And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. I got a couple of quotes to start off. A couple uh, people that really don't know who the author is, but they said this. If God were small enough for us to understand, he would not be big enough to worship. If God was small enough for us to understand, he would not be big enough for us to worship. Number, number two, it's just a little poem that says, some come to church to take a walk. Some come to church to laugh and to talk. Some go to church to meet a friend. Some go to church their time to spend. Some go to church to meet a lover. Some go to church a fault to cover. Some go to church for speculation. Some go to church for observation. Some go to church to doze and nod. The wise go there to worship God. So whatever you came here for this, mo this morning, I hope it was only one thing, and that is to worship God. Nothing else. For those of you that came to get some sleep, You might have to find it hard. This morning, um, I forgot to bring my squirt gun. <laughs> but let's talk. If you go back to verse number 40, when Martha is speaking, it gives us kind of a, nobody's really talking, it's giving us an observation in this verse because here's the thing if you try to come into church to serve and if all you're doing is serving this is where a lot of people get misdirected when they talk about spiritual burnout because you can come into church and serve and can get what they call spiritual burnout, but that is not correct. What you do is you get physically wore out. Because here's the point. Service without worship will cause you to lose your focus. Service without worship will cause you to lose your focus. How do I know that? Verse 40. Martha was distracted by many tasks. And she came up and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand, will you? See, what happened was Martha got totally distracted. Because what happens, and let me say this to you, what happens when we get distracted in serving the Lord, it, be, it can become a burdensome weight. Man, i got to get up in the morning and, and teach another Sunday school class. Why? It's a bunch of kids. They, they, all they do is want to run around. I can't get them to sit still. They, they seem to be totally way out there. And I know they're 55, Lord. <laughs> but I just can't seem to get a handle on them. And, and it seems like that what ends up happening is we get distracted. It's the same thing in here. 
when we come. When you come in here to worship, there can be a distraction that will cause you to lose sight of what you're doing. For instance, um, oh, who was it? Linda put a post out this week talking about children, uh, people getting distracted because a baby in the service was crying. And um, in some churches, honestly, I have heard um, churches where if you have a baby and it cries, they send the usher to ask you to take the baby to the nursery. They will come and poke you if you fall asleep. You know, if, you're, if you do a lot of things, you know, they, they, they have the ushers that stand back there as guards. <laughs> and they want to watch everything. And, and, and Satan can provide those distractions that we can get distracted from. And in serving God, a lot of times it can be distracting or Satan will try to distract us with everything. And, and so what happens is it becomes a burdensome weight. It, it looked, you know, it said that Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And if you look in some of the other uh, translations, it will use the word cumbersome. Not, not distracted, but was cumbersome. And the word cumbersome means to be driven about mentally, to be distracted, to be over-occupied, too busy about a thing. And sometimes what happens is, when we come into service, we can get distracted by a lot of things that are out there. And they can be provided. Sometimes you're not even looking and it's right there. It just hits you straight in the face. The word cumbersome. To be driven about mentally. And I keep sharing with people. Let me, let me say this to you. If you go back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, in, in, in the garden, Satan played mental tricks with Eve. Amen. You've been admiring that fruit. It's awful pretty, isn't it? Oh, touch. Oh, it feels good. You've eaten from everything else. And I know that a lot, everything that you've eaten you really like, even the broccoli. You, you know, they didn't know any better. Okay? <laughs> But I bet if you took a bite of that, of that fruit, you would find it is the most delicious thing that you could ever take. Oh, but God said, the day we eat of that, we're going to die. He's God, come on. He's not going to kill you. He played the mental, the mental task, the mental game. So let me say this to you. It worked back then. It has worked since then. So why in the world should it change? It works. He throws a little thing in your mind. You get distracted because we begin to focus on these things. Look, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it says the yoke, when you talk about... Um, in these verses, he, he says, you know, listen, if you've got a burden and things that, that are, are weighing you down, that are getting to you, Jesus says this about that. Look at what he says. Come to me. He didn't say go to somebody else. He said, come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? I'll give you another job to do. You don't have, you've got too much time on your hands, I'll give you something else. I will give you rest. You're stressed out. Things are happening. I will give you rest. But how does he give us rest? Here's what he says. Take up my yoke. Take up my yoke. Not yours. 
Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take up my yoke and learn from me. What does that mean? That means I go back into the scriptures and I learn how did Jesus do this? You think about it. What was his whole life about, ladies and gentlemen? <coughs> Worship to the Father. Service. <coughs> Service. You want to talk about somebody that could have been distracted and burdened? That's Jesus. Walking down the road and hearing 12 of these guys that he's, that he's going to know that's going to take over when he leaves, and they're arguing. And he's thinking, they haven't got it. Father, how much longer do I need to stay with these people? And, and, he's, and I know it's coming soon, but Lord, I'm not really, God, I'm not really sure they're ready. And he's saying, they're ready, they're ready. Don't worry, I got it. Well, hold on, maybe I need to spend some more time. I don't know what he's, conversation, I don't know what's going on. But Jesus could have been very easily distracted from the task. But he says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me because why? I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest. For what? For your feet? Huh? For your soul. What we want, and, and honestly, think about it. What do we get tired from? We get tired from worrying, stress, and work. Show me anybody that has ever got tired from worship. Huh? When we really get into worship, we get wiped out from everything else. Because where's our focus? Because now God does a mind thing that wipes out the Satan thing. And so what happens is service can be a burdensome, a burdensome thing. But Jesus says, listen, my yoke is easy. Not only is it easy, it is well fitted. Did you ever think about it? My, uh, my dad was gaining weight. My sister bought him a pair of pants. He wore a size 40 waist. That's really what he wore. She got him the pair of pants. She forgot to take the tag off of it. Because he says, these pants are too big. I wear a 38. And so he would take his pants and he, I gotta pull mine up too. <laughs> no. He would pull his pants up and say, see, they're too big. You need to go back and exchange them. So what did she do? She took the pants, left for a while, took the tag off of it, brought it back to my dad and said, now here, try these on. They were the same pants. They were a size 40. He put those on and he just pranced around. See how well they fit? I told you I wear a 38. He never knew the difference. Let me say this to you. What Jesus is saying, ladies and gentlemen, is this. That if you take upon his yoke, it doesn't matter whether you have a 38 or 40. It doesn't matter if you wear a, five, a size 5 in children or a 25 in ladies or a 44 in men or 48 in men. Have I covered everybody? I think so. What I'm saying to you is this. That so many times what we carry seems so heavy. It doesn't fit us. And what Jesus says, take my yoke, I guarantee you, it will fit you. Not only will it fit you, it will be light. You won't fall from the weight of this because it's already been proven and tried and tested. And so we, we begin to see these things. And 
what he was saying to them, and sometimes in the same way to us, to them the law was really heavy. They couldn't measure up to the law. They, they, God had given them the, the law, and man, they had to take and break it down and break it down and break it down to the point where nobody knew what the law was. They had so many rules, and they, they couldn't handle this. And, and what happens is, if we come to serve God without worshiping, it's the same way. Our yoke becomes really heavy. It's unbearable. Because the focus is not there. We're distracted. It happens to all of us. Trust me. I know. There are sometimes pastors on Monday morning, that is the day of the week that most pastors resign. They come out of the pulpit on Sunday, drain, wasted, and everything, it's just crumbling upon them, and they just look and say, I'm done. And they resign. Because why? And I don't, I don't, know, I don't know about y'all, but hey, I feel good after Sunday. I'm here to worship. I'm here to say, thank you, God. How great are you? Because I'm no longer a slave. I'm free in these things. Now, let me say this. Number two, without worship, our attitude won't be right. If you're trying to serve God without worship, you've got a bad attitude. And if you don't, you will. You will. How many more times do I have to do nursery duty? I don't have no kids in there. I raised my kids. I don't want any more snotty nosed kids. I'm done changing diapers. And then we have grandkids. <laughs> Mom, will you watch kids while we go out for a while? No, they're still in diapers. Bring them back when they're 12. <laughs> Mom, Dad, um, can you babysit for a few hours? Or um, how about a week? We're, we're going on vacation. Well, why don't you take your kids like we took you? We need some alone time. You'll have plenty of that later. And in those alone times, you'll wish you had some pitter-patter of little feet every once in a while running around. It keeps us young. <laughs> it also makes us old. But honestly, you think about it on Sunday night when we go out, when we go back there for a water, man, there's some rough kids. And they can be a drain. And with the wrong attitude, we go, we, you, you can go out of here on Sunday night. Man, I'm done. I, I'm just not coming back anymore. Until all of a sudden you realize that little child that was so bad just gave their heart to the Lord. Or that little child that was so bad wanted to come up and give you a hug and say, you know what, thank you. I love you. I come in here this morning and um, uh, Isabella, uh, as soon as I walk back there, she says, here, I got, I got a card for you. And she read a card to Pastor Chuck of our church. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and I hope you have a happy new year from Isabella Day. And, and those are the kind of things, man, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, God. You, you gave me the blessings that, uh, that sometimes you need to understand why, why are we doing this thing. You, you see, if you really go back and look at the Bible and other parts of the Bible, you will find that Martha really was a kind and a loving person. You just get one glimpse here and you think she, was, she is awful. Go back and read the rest of the story. 
you will find that Mary was a kind and a loving person. But for a moment here, she lost her focus. Her, fo her focus was more on the task of feeding Jesus and making sure he didn't go away hungry. And Jesus was trying to tell to her, you're not going to have me much longer. The focus ought to be on worshiping me, not feeding me. He tried to help her direct, redirect the things. And so what we need to understand is that sometimes when we lose our focus, we need to bring it back. It's, it's like you got glasses and you notice that your eyesight is changing. And so when you go to the doctor, you don't ask him to replace your eyeballs. Right? Yeah. I mean, you can, you can have cataracts removed and you can have LASIK surgery and everything else, but they still got to do something to, for, able for you to see. It's, you know, you get bifocals, <laughs> trifocals and quadfocals. You know, you've got more lines than Carter's got liver pills in your, in your glasses trying to find a way to see. And, and, and at night, you can't see. You know, the glare and everything that's, that's there. And, and, and you've got to learn how to focus to be able to see. That's the same way it is in serving. We, we got to take our focus off of everything else and understand, let's worship. Worship Him. And when we worship Him and understand, then, then service, service comes easy. It doesn't become a difficult task. It doesn't become a burden. Why am I starting with this? Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the center of all of this. If you don't worship Him, you can't do anything else. You can say, hey, I want to get into ministry. I want to do this. I want to do that. And you can do all of that. And um, let me tell you this. You will be burnt out and quitting. Because it will drain you. But when you learn that the center of everything that we do is not what we do, but who we worship, then everything else falls in line. And so we got to start out the year the right way, okay? A lot of times, churches will split. And, and, let me, and sometimes they split in worship. And, and what is it about the worship? I don't like the song. Well, hold on a minute. What is, what is the purpose of that song? The words of the song. You, you don't understand. The words of the song are great, but I don't like the beat. I don't think that God asked you what is the right beat to worship Him. I don't care if you can't dance. Like Jonathan? <laughs> or that you dance like me. I have no rhythm. I can keep a beat for a while, but then I'm gone. My wife gets so upset with me. She, she would say, she says, here, let's put a song on and dance. And I said, okay, cool. And so we put on the, the song, and what I hear is this, you got to move. It's like, those aren't concrete, dude. And I said, but you know, I don't want to mess up with your feet, you know? It doesn't work. It's dance with me. And I said, but you don't understand. I, I don't know how to dance. And she says, just move. Hey. Wrong thing to say. <laughs> she says, you move and I'll follow. I'm sorry, but I think sometimes even God would have a hard time following this dance. But the thing of it is, is what we need to understand is this. If we learn how to worship first, and we do that, everything else falls in place. You, you'll say, I can't do this, I can't do that. And you know what God's saying is? Shut up. 
You don't understand. Here's what I'm saying to you. I would not ask you to do anything that I have not equipped you for. Now, there are some things that we get things wrong. Please understand. I know. I've done that sometimes. I got ahead of God. And I've had to backtrack. And then I have to come back to understand, hey, God, what's the worship all about? Church division. We were talking about, yeah, that's what we're talking about. What difference does it make if you've got green pews, red pews, or no pews? You know, there's a lot of churches around the world that have nothing but dirt floors. They have no seats. They crowd in hundreds of them, thousands of them in, into spaces that they could get into. And some of them stand outside the building. And they're there for hours, ladies and gentlemen, not 15 minutes, not 30 minutes. They're there for hours. Their focus isn't on a time. Most of them, some of them don't even have a watch. Okay? They just know that the sun's still up and it's not time to feed the cows. So, hey, I'm here, man. Let's just praise God. And, and they will go for hours just praising God. Stop for a little while, maybe take a bite to eat and come back and let's go again. Because where's their focus? Their focus is based upon who they're worshiping. Not in the task that they had to do. In the same way with church division. Church division, the reason a lot of times church, churches become divided is they lose the focus. It's more based on my personal taste of what I want rather than what it is that God desires. And sometimes we've got to get our personal taste out of it. And we've got to say, God, what is it you want us to do? Who is it you want us to minister to? Jesus said to Martha, you are careful and troubled by many things. Now, this word careful has two meanings here. It can be, one, to be worried, and also to be seeking one's own interest. So what did he say? Martha, or, or Mary, you need, you need, um, or, or, or Jesus said, Martha, you are, are careful and troubled by many things. You, you've lost it. You're worried about these things. You're seeking your own desire. You're not seeking my desire. What is your desire? Your desire is for me to tell Mary to get up and get in the kitchen. No. My desire is to let her sit here and worship with me. That's my desire. And Martha thought, surely, surely Jesus knows how hard it is for me to cook this meal. And Jesus is really very, very compassionate, has always been. And every time he shows up at our house, which is quite frequently, he's always been really, really compassionate. And this time he's going to be real, real, real compassionate. And he's going to tell Mary, get up and help me. Mary, your place needs to be in there with Martha helping to, to fix whatever meal it was that she was going to fix. You, you know? But... Not that. Look at what G Jesus told her. Back over there in verse number 42. But one thing is necessary. One thing. He didn't say there's 55 different things and here's a list that I want you to be concerned about. One thing is necessary. And when he says there's one thing, then you got to understand, whatever it is that I'm going to talk about is the most important thing you need to get, Martha. You need to get to the point, and you need to understand this one thing. And it, let me say this, if you don't get this one thing right, that what you need 
Because your relationship with God will never, ever be what God wants it to be. I'm not talking about what you want. I'm talking about what God wants. Get you out of the equation. May I, may I say this to you? It is not you and Jesus. It is Jesus in you. Not A-N-D, I-N. It is the Holy Spirit of God. When, when we understand what is, when he says it's important or needed thing, it's needed because our relationship with God has to be right. If it's not right, we, we spend so much time. How do I know? I've been here. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, I am the Nike standard. Just do it. It doesn't work. I wish sometimes I could go back and redo a lot of things over in my life. <laughs> There's a lot of times of things that I did, I thought I did right in serving God, but yet my relationship with Him was not right. And so what ended up happening was, I ended up just spinning my wheels. And I kept asking Him, okay God, hold on a minute. I'm serving you, I'm doing exactly what you want me to do, I'm going to church every Sunday, I'm tithing every Sunday, I'm talking to people just the way you want me to talk to, I'm trying my best to lead people to the Lord, and God, I'm just not seeing any fruits. And He said, did you check your relationship? How's your worship? Well, what do you mean? God, you don't understand. I'm pastoring and I'm working full time. I don't have a lot of time for prayer. God, I'm pastoring and working. I don't have a lot of time for Bible reading. So God, you got to help me do sermons in an hour. That's about what I got. Other than that, it ain't going to work. And you know what he did to me? He gave me a job where I had to drive two hours in the morning <laughs> to go to work by myself. You don't have any time? Guess what you got now? You got two hours, bro. <laughs> now what you gonna do? Can I tell you, driving up 71 or 70, going from Camden to Dayton, or Camden to Columbus, or Westchester to Columbus, driving those roads with those crazy people, you do a lot of talking to God. <laughs> and you get a lot of closer to Him. And you find out then, hold on, you were missing something. So you know what I started doing? I knew the stations. It was listen to this one program or that program, listen to this music and that music, and just jamming away. It was just me and Jesus. Two hours up and two hours back. You get a lot of worship time. In working eight to nine hours, sometimes 10, sometimes 12, you can get drained, and it can drain you. But I think if you ask my wife, she will tell you that that was probably the most happiest job I was ever in. It wasn't just the money, good money, but it was because I had a lot of other things to redirect my attention in, in those things, okay? So, why is worship there? To get our relationship right. Number two, to get our yoke right. Because what happens is, when our focus comes off of God and onto our own issues, that yoke gets heavy. And let me say this to you. When you start trying to carry that thing by yourself, you are going to fall. That's why yoke up with Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. You ain't fallen. He 
He's got you and always will. Why is worship needful? It's also needful because it helps us to prepare for service. This year, you're going to be asked to do stuff. And you're going to be asked to serve. But let me say this. If your worship doesn't get right, serving is going to become difficult for you. And it's going to become a task. Not something that, well, I look forward to. You see, there was um, a few years ago, there was these three gray whales and they, they had them on camera and, and they were watching them. And they were ice bound off of a point in Alaska, it was called Point Barrow. And they floated by this point and as everybody watched, these three gray whales were all battered and bloody as everybody watched them and they were gasping because the place was frozen and they were trapped underneath there. And they were looking for a spot in the ice that somebody could, had broken through or where the ice had been broken, a place that they could breathe because they were going to die. And their only hope was to be transported five miles past this ice pack to the open sea. And so what ended up happening was these, these uh, people that were part of uh, the rescue, what they began to do was going out every 20 yards in front of this pack of these three gray whales, and they would cut holes in the ice so that the whales could come every 20 yards and could come up to that hole and get the breath of air that they were needing until finally they got out past the, the, the ice to the open sea. And you got to understand, this ice was six, six inches thick. But guess what? They saved those whales. Let me say this to you. It took them 80 days to make that trip and to do those things, but it saved those whales. There are times that you need to understand that here's what worship is all about. When you feel like your whole life is, you're drowning, and there's no place to breathe, let me say this to you, God's ahead of you, and he will bring you to the point to rescue you so that you can breathe again. And you'll make that journey all the way to the end because he's guiding you. And all you got to do is keep looking for those places that where God has brought me to breathe, to breathe, to breathe. You need to understand that in the book of Luke, and you could go back and read it in Luke chapter 12, where he starts talking about a house divided and all these other things. It's talking about worship and what is worship. Worship is pouring ourselves out to, to the Lord. It's not holding anything back. It's no expense. It's like, you don't understand, Lord. Man, I really don't feel good. I worked all night. I'm tired. I'm going to go there. The guy's boring. I'm going to fall asleep within about 10 minutes. I, I can start singing my sermons if you like. I guarantee you that would keep you awake. It never did put my kids to sleep. And maybe I should have sang to them more and should have talked to them. So many times we, we, um, we forget. And you want to know what happens? Here's what worship becomes. I offer to God what is convenient for me.
uh, this Sunday. It's cool. I don't have anything else to do, so I'll just come. You mean I've got to make time in my schedule to do this? Okay, fine. Um, here's my schedule. Uh, 10.30 to 12 o'clock, I'm going to worship. Now, I understand some people have to leave and, and stuff. I understand that. Okay, medication and all that stuff, other stuff. But others that don't are constantly watching your watch to see when am I going to shut up so that I can, we can go eat. <laughs> What's more convenient? Feeding your belly or feeding your soul? No, I didn't say what's necessary. I said what's convenient. It's more convenient for me to feed my belly than it is to feed my soul. Because feeding my soul means I have to change something. And sometimes that's not good. Sometimes I don't want to change that. Feeding my belly, that gets rid of the hunger pain. So sometimes it's more convenient to do, to do things. But worship is not, is not about what's making me convenient. Worship, ladies and gentlemen, brings you out of your comfort zone. It won't leave you there. Um, you don't believe me? I love to pick on people. And that is, I'm going to pick on Carol. I met Carol and Chet back in 1987, I think it was. That's, that was uh, last year. I met them and then. At the time we met Carol, um, she was very quiet. You want to talk introvert? That was Carol. Um, she didn't get out of the house much, did you? Work. Huh? Work. House to work, back to the house. And that's where she went. Um, if I look at Carol today, she goes back there and she teaches these young kids. Uh, grades one through three. We're talking um, six through eight. She can't get down and play with these kids. She has physically uh, a lot of things that, that she could say, I can't do this anymore. Physically, I can't. You go in there and you'll find that all the kids love her. We come into worship, she'll talk. She'll raise her hands. She'll shout. Every once in a while, she'll take a trip. It's not convenient. It would be convenient to sit where she's at and just take it all in. But she doesn't do what's convenient. Sometimes we need to watch and observe people and say, hold on a minute, really? Time to share and time to look and time to see these things that are there. In Luke chapter 12, 1 through 7, this, this part is, is about where um, uh, they're pouring out the oil on Jesus and the hair and all of this stuff. And here, here's what some of the things that we, we don't understand. And, and that is this. When you look at the things that, that were happening there, you'll find that she took her hair and she began to, she, she took the ointment, which was the ointment that you would prepare for people to, uh, to die. And, and this ointment was worth 300 pence. You know how much 300 pence was? 300 pence was equivalent to one year's salary back then. So think about right now. 
Let's say that the average worker was to get $45,000, okay? I, I don't know if that's true, but uh, I'm just gonna throw you a number, $45,000. How would you like to take something that's worth $45,000 and put it on somebody's foot? And then take your hair, which was long, and begin to wipe his feet with your hair. Because you gotta understand something. The washing of the feet was reserved to the lowest servant in the house. She gave everything that she had to the Lord to become the lowest of the servant to worship Him. <coughs> to worship Him. Remember what Judah said? <laughs> Lord, what are we doing here? Do you know how much money we could have put into the treasury? And how many mouths we could have fed if we could have taken that oil that, that she had wasted on your feet? Oh, we could, have, we could have fed all the population of Middletown for that $45,000 for a day or, or a week or so. <clears throat> but he said, you don't understand. She came here because she knows that I'm going to die. Let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know you're going to die? One day, you will. My question is this. Will you give up everything that you've got to become the lowest of servants to worship the Lord? That's what he's asking. And when we, when we come to that point of understanding, Lord, I will give you everything I've got. Everything that I've got is yours. In actuality, it's his anyway. If he wants to take it away from you, he can. Okay. But he gives you things for your needs to help you. And what I say to you is this, God, I give it back to you. All of it. All of it, Lord. Because I want to worship you. And you know what? When you do that, you will find that serving the Lord is the most wonderful, beautiful thing that you can ever do. That's worship. That's worship. We start out with the basic. I've got to give you the foundation. That's what I've given you today. It's a new year, ladies and gentlemen. How are you going to start it? I know you're already five days in and you've five days behind you. Who cares? I don't care what you've done in the first five days of this, four, four days of this year. This is only the fifth, right? Yeah, cool. Okay. All right. So I don't care what you've done for the first four. I'm talking about what do you want to do from this point forward? From this point forward, can you say to the Lord right here, right now, with all honesty, God, I give you everything. Everything that I am, God, I give everything to you to worship you. If you can't, I ask you to search yourself and say, Lord, here I am right now. Search me, try me, cleanse me, O Lord. Would you? If you want to talk to him there, you're more than welcome. You want to talk to him here, you're more than welcome. You don't know him, you're more than welcome to come and we'll, we'll, we'll introduce you to the best. The best. His name is Jesus. The one who wants to give you what you need. First of all, that need, ladies and gentlemen, salvation. Second is learning how to serve Him. But you can't serve Him unless you worship Him. So let's start. Let's stand, would you? Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also 
invite you to come to our church and visit us if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.